thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from United Christian Church of Austin, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon for Sunday, June 5th, 2016, is entitled, The Consequences of Doing Right Wrong. It continues in our sermon series with Prophet Elijah, reading from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministries at United Christian Church, simply head over to our website, www.uccaustin.org. Thank you. For our scripture reading today, we continue what we began last week, reading from the Hebrew Bible, from the book of 1 Kings, this time chapter 19, verses 1 through 15. May God take these words and make from them a holy word for us today. King Ahab told his queen Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets of Baal and Asherah with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, I swear, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of those you killed by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough, he said. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? (laughs) He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the presence of the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard that, he wrapped his face in his his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return. Friends, God is still speaking to the world. May our hearts be open to listen and to respond. Amen. So last week, we began this three-week journey with Elijah through the texts offered for our reflection by the Revised Common Lectionary. 
this past Sunday, this Sunday, and again on the 26th, we'll spend some time with this prophet of the Yahweh God, who was active in his own day in the ninth century before the Common Era, before the birth of Jesus, during the very difficult reign of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel in the northern kingdom of Israel. It was a time of falling away from the true worship of God and falling into injustice and exploitation and greed from the top down. And the people found their situation reflected in nature around them in a terrible drought that gripped the land for years. And so Elijah, in the midst of all that, felt called to challenge Ahab and Jezebel and their court prophets the 450 prophets of the god Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah challenged them to a kind of duel, a contest for the hearts and minds of the people of Israel to decide whose god was really god, whose god would show up and get the job done. It was all over in a flash, in a blaze of fire and light as the Lord God showed up and showed up in spades. Go God. But then Elijah took it a step further. Took it just one verse too far in the reading set out for us by the lectionary. And in that one verse, Elijah turned and incited the people to murder all 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah in the name of the Lord God. And now, He's on the run from that king and queen. He is in full retreat mode, fleeing the consequences of his actions, fleeing out into the wilderness and the wild places, out into the desert, where the mighty man of God runs smack dab into the presence of that God. Not in the mighty wind or the earthquake or the fire, but in the still small voice that comes to him in the sound of sheer silence in between his own heartbeats. In the presence of God that sustains him in his need and listens to his complaint and challenges him and reorients him and sends him back. As I said last week, most of us who grew up in churches and many of us who did not come with the idea that it's my job as the pastor and preacher to stand up here and proclaim to you the correct way of interpreting these scriptures. As if somehow my four and a half years in a three year seminary degree program gifted me with the teacher's key to the textbook. And I just have to look up the right page and the right answer to find the correct way, as if there were only one. This is part of the baggage we bring to our faith. This idea that somehow the Bible is easy, like a set of instructions to build faith, like a piece of Ikea furniture. What a thin way, what a thin way of considering what we believe to be the word of God in Scripture. Rather, I would say to you that it's my job to stand up here Sunday after Sunday, year in, year out, reading these stories over and over and over again, not to drill into you the correct way of reading, but to invite you into your own conversation, your own experience of Scripture. Read, as theologian Karl Barth said, right alongside the daily newspaper your Facebook feed, the events of your life, ever changing. It's our job here together as a community of faith to examine these stories and look at them from a variety of angles, to hold them up to the light like a precious stone and look for the cracks and the fault lines and the flaws, the ways that it catches and refracts the light as well as the hidden shadows. It's our job as we enter into this experience with scripture to listen for those voices that are present in the story and in our traditions about them. And also to ask ourselves, who's missing? Who's not at this table? Where are the rough edges and the red flags as well as the unexpected beauty in scripture? 
We do this not just to annoy you, not just to make things more difficult, as if we could actually make life even more difficult, but rather to try and open these stories up to open this ancient book of books so that the Spirit may breathe through them and offer us more than just a dusty glimpse in the mirror of the past or a funhouse reflection of the present, but something deeper, something more meaningful, something truly divinely inspired, something of God to shape our living today. And so we came together last week and we read the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, aware that according to our inherited tradition, Elijah is supposed to be the good guy. He's supposed to be the hero. And it's true, as with so many things, in part. Yeah, Elijah was in fact a prophet of God and remained faithful to God when many around him were falling away and falling into injustice and immorality. It's true that he spoke truth to power. He was courageous and challenged the unjust rule of Ahab and Jezebel and stood up for the worship of Yahweh God and of God's ways of justice, peace, and compassion in the world. Remembering that those are not just New Testament values. Those aren't just Jesus values. Where do you think Jesus got them? <clears throat> but in reading the story, and reading all the way, and holding it up and considering it, and looking just past the easy edges offered to us by the lectionary, there's a reason they cut that passage off where they did. We see, that, we see that Elijah, good old Elijah, while trying to do a good thing, also did a terrible thing. He incited his followers to violence. In fact, to murder those who opposed him in the name of God. With the very best of intentions, believing himself to be smack dab centered in the will of God, Elijah does right wrong, very, very wrong. His actions caused great suffering. And he himself has been driven out into the de desert wilds where he suffers the consequences of his actions as well. My friends, this right here is where I begin to identify with Elijah. Not Elijah, the mighty prophet, not Elijah, the hero of God, but rather Elijah, the broken, the confused, the mistaken, the searching. He's still not even really sure what he's done exactly. If you listen to the story and try and listen for his voice, he's not really even sure why the things he've done, he's done have gone so very wrong. He runs it over and over again in his mind. I can identify with that over and over again. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord. I've tried to do the right thing. For the Israelites, the people of God, have forsaken God's covenant, thrown down God's altars, killed God's prophets with the sword. Notice the complete lack of self-awareness in that statement. I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. <clears throat> Elijah, the well-intentioned but missing the mark by a mile. That sounds familiar. That sounds entirely too familiar. I mean, where do we start with the list of our best intentions gone awry? And best intentions is being charitable in many cases. Which story to pick? I'll, I'll go with this one. Long, long ago in a city far, far away called New Haven, Connecticut. The city fathers, and they were all fathers at that time, decided that it would be a good thing for their community if they were to build a highway connector to make it easier for some of their citizens to get from point A to point B, a much needed infrastructure upgrade. That's a good thing, right? We hear that in the news all the time. In order to do this, of course, they would need to bulldoze the Oak Street neighborhood 
but hey, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, right? Can't please everyone. And so they didn't. And they bulldozed this multiracial, multi-ethnic neighborhood, a bridge between upscale downtown New Haven on one side and historically disadvantaged New Haven on the other. And then they never built the connector. They ran out of money, something. But at the end of the day and for the next 50 years, they left their community not only without an upgrade, but without a bridge. Now they had a moat, a vast empty stretch of moat between the good side of town and the bad side of town. A living wound in the fabric of the city that would not be addressed for decades to come. Consequences, even to our best of intentions. How about this? A nation, any nation, let's call it the United States of America. A nation with the very best of intentions and the highest of ideals. This nation seeks to challenge a despotic ruler of another nation, let's call it Iraq. A truly nasty man, unjust, a perpetrator of great evil against his own people and his neighbors. So they, we, organize a military campaign of shock and all flashes of light and fire to topple his regime. And we do, and we stand atop the fallen statue and raise the flag and cry victory. And yet, we're not exactly prepared for the consequences. The consequences for the people of that nation or for the people of our own for that matter. We imagine that we would be welcomed as liberators. How could it be any other way than the story we tell ourselves in our heads? But we found ourselves occupiers for the next 15 years and more. The people of that nation and now of all the surrounding nations, our servicemen and women and their families and everyone who lives under our economy continue to experience the painful consequences of even our best intentions. Our choosing to do the right thing, arguably a very wrong way. Of course, the same things happen on a smaller scale. They happen on a personal scale in our own lives as well. As we seek to discern God's will and to follow it, to walk in God's ways, in the very limited and limiting ways we understand it. That sends ripples throughout our lives and the lives of our families and our friends and our coworkers and our neighbors and our networks and our communities. Ripples upon ripples, ripples interacting with ripples reaching all the way around the world. So many consequences we might be able to foresee and forestall if we just took a moment and st stepped back and considered ourselves, and so many more we couldn't possibly. To quote an expert in retrospect, now what's the message here? The message is that there are no knowns. There are things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say there are things that we know now we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we do not know. Former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, ladies and gentlemen. And that is part of the message for us. That's part of that hard truth that we receive from the hand of God. But there is another part, thank God. A better part of the amazing grace that comes to us from God, though better is perhaps even too simple a word, just as good or love may be too simple. Because when Elijah tries to run away from the consequences of his actions, he does run smack dab into the arms of God. The God who even in his faulty, frailty nature sustains Elijah even in his flight from responsibility. A God who listens to his side of his complaint over and over again. 
A God who shows up not just when Elijah asks God to, but when Elijah needs God to. But on God's own terms, in ways that Elijah could not scarcely have imagined. Not in the forces of nature and the wind and the earthquake and the fire. And I can't help think there of the fire that Elijah called down upon the altar before veering off course. Not just in shock and awe, but in the sound of sheer silence. In the still, small voice of conscience and prayer. It's that still, small voice of God, still speaking, that sustains Elijah, that listens to him, that comforts him, and also challenges him. God picks up Elijah and dusts him off and hugs him close and then sends him back into the world, into the midst of the consequences he helped create, sends him back to try again. In the same way, God sustains us and listens to us over and over again and comforts us and also challenges us. Also calling us and sending us back into the world week after week, day after day. We come here into the sanctuary of this place, hopefully to encounter the presence of the living God, but not to stay here, not to stay in the deserted places, but to go out back into the world that we have helped to make. God help us. God calls us in this place and in every time and place to widen our vision. To think as we reflect and plan and pray before acting, asking ourselves, who's at this table? Who has a stake in our actions? Whose lives will we touch and how in the world? What are the costs and who bears them? And are they bearing them in a disproportionate manner? Or are they born equally among all? God calls us to listen harder, to listen for those voices that we regularly ignore, to listen for the still small voice of our neighbors, those on the margins and those in need. God calls us to do our best. And when our best inevitably proves not quite good enough to transform the world as God would have us do, to trust God, to be there to catch us, to hold us, to correct us, and send us back again. Comforted, challenged, and called by the Spirit of the living God. So friends, if you've heard the word of God preached here today, remember to give all honor and glory to our one God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit.